And Kant's claim is that any maxim that meets that minimal requirement, just it's possible for it to make its end objectively valuable. Any maxim that for which it's possible, sorry, any maxim for which it's possible for it to make its end objectively valuable, ready? Does make its end objectively valuable when it's acted on. So the mere permit, the, the mere possibility of its doing so, because it could be universalized, and that's what's required in order to be able to make its end objectively valuable. The mere possibility of it serving to make its ends objectively valuable is enough when it's actually acted upon. So it really is a good will that makes ends objectively valuable whenever, as it were, it can. I'll say it, I'll say it the other way around. Um, say a maxim could not be the basis for objective value. Could not be the basis for objective value because not everybody could possibly act on it. Well then, uh, that bad maxim, that maxim which cannot make its end objectively valuable because it's one that not everybody could act on. Well, now, even if someone does act on it, that end is not objectively valuable. Because it couldn't possibly be objectively valuable. Because it couldn't possibly be the case that everybody could act on. Okay, so in this case, where a maxim cannot be universalized, somebody could still, one individual, could still act on that maxim, still pursue that end, for that reason specified by the maxim. Whenever a person wills an end, they take it to be good. So when a person acts on this bad maxim, they take the end to be good. We might say it's subjectively good for them. But that maxim couldn't possibly be one that makes that end objectively good. So while that person thinks that their end is good, they subjectively take that end to be good, they're mistaken. They're wrong about that because that maxim couldn't possibly make its end objectively good. Go back to the good case now. Any maxim that could possibly make its end objectively valuable when somebody acts on it, does in fact make that end objective. Is that clear? Questions about that? Okay, so one more point before um, going on to talk about the example that he gives the first example. Why does it matter if somebody actually acts upon the maxim? Right. So there are lots of maxims that could possibly be universalized, but it's only when someone acts on that, when someone takes that principle as the basis for their action, that they then take that end to be good. And if it's a good maxim, it is good. So if the condition for an end being objectively good is not that someone could possibly will it rationally. It's that someone actually does will it rationally, permissibly. So it really is the good, it really is a good will that's the condition for states of affairs being objectively good, not the mere possibility of a good will willing it. Now there's going to be a complication on this. Um, that we'll come to later on. But that's the sort of base case. States of affairs of the world 
are made good when someone wills them. Rational. That is, when someone wills them on the basis of a maxim that could possibly serve to make those ends objective. Does that, does that answer? Okay, there's got, as I said, there's going to be a complication. I'll just tell you what the complication is going to be. The complication is going to, it's going to turn out that some ends are good even if nobody actually has willed them. But we'll see. These, these, of course, are not going to be empirical ends. These are not going to be states and affairs that we can identify ahead of time. That would make it totally logical. But it is going to turn out that we can identify certain kinds of ends as requirements, as necessary ends for a rational being. Okay. And, and, sorry. And those ends, we can say, are good even if nobody actually has willed them. They're requirements of rational willing. That is, any rational will must. Will them. Okay. Last point. Right, that confused you. And it confused you because you asked exactly the right question before. What about a good will? Isn't that an end in some sense? I said, yes, it is an end in some sense, not in the sense of being an empirical state of it. It's exactly what I'm talking about. So, so a, a rational will is going to be a necessary end in a certain sense of being an end, not a material end, not a state. Okay, last point before looking at the example he gives. Um, when we think about the world of experience, when we think about what Kant sometimes calls the phenomenal world, when we think about the world as described by natural science, well, uh, if you remember back to my introduction to Kantian metaphysics, I said that Kant thinks that we never, never have an experience of freedom. We never have an impression of freedom. So in this world as described by empirical natural science, there's never going to be uh, freedom found in it. Uh, there's never going to be a free will found in it. Everything in this phenomenal world is governed by the principle of efficient causality. One thing causes the subsequent thing to happen. And everything has a prior cause. Everything can be explained by prior events causing it. And this means in the world of experience, this means in the empirical world of natural science, there's nothing that's naturally an end, naturally a goal. And this means that there's nothing in the world of empirical experience, the world that's described by natural science, the phenomenal world, Kant would say, there's nothing that's naturally good. And that's why Kant would say, Natural science isn't going to tell us, can't tell us, what we should or should not do. Natural science, natural empirical science, is never going to be able to tell us what we have reason to do or not to do. It just tells us, or natural science aims to tell us, uh, what will happen or what would happen if something else happened. It doesn't provide any basis for evaluating outcomes. It doesn't provide any basis for making um, evaluations. So that's the world of science. It's, a, it's the world of physics. But if we now add to this picture something from outside of it, something that physics doesn't describe something that natural science doesn't describe, something that we never have an impression, an empirical impression of. If we add to this picture a, the idea of a person with a free will, then things change. 
So I want to emphasize that this is not a discovery within natural science. But if we postulate the existence of a free will, of a rational will, then introducing such a being introduces into this picture ends what it is that we will. We will end. And therefore, it introduces into this picture evaluations. Uh, implicit, at least, judgments of what is good. So a will wills ends on the basis of principles, its maxims. And whatever ends it wills, it takes to be good. That's subjectively good. And in taking those ends to be good, it actually does make those ends good, objectively good, whenever it's possible for them to be objectively good. That is, whenever the maximum on which it acts could be universalized. If it's impossible for the maximum to be universalized, then the subjective end is not, in fact, good. But if it is possible for that maxim on which the will acts to be universalized, to be the basis for some end being objective, then when a will acts on that maxim, it actually makes that end good. And um, lastly, this is all done by postulating this perspective of a will person from outside of the picture of the phenomenal world that natural science is. Um, OK. I guess I haven't said it today, but this um, uh, universalizability, this requirement on maxims that they have this formal property, it's not that they're aiming at some particular object that we already know about, but this formal property that they could be universalized. That requirement, of course, is, the, is called the categorical imperative. We'll see why later on. I don't understand why there can't be any objectively good ends without a universalized maximum driving will. To do it. Uh, I'm saying nothing good can come from someone operating under a maximum that only they consider. Um, they might accidentally bring about a good end. Yeah, this doesn't account for accidental good things. Either. Well, no. Uh, so, so somebody might accidentally bring about an end that is good. That is, they might act on a maxim that's not good, but bring about an end that is good. So this is the shopkeeper example. Right? Somebody who wants to charge a fair price because that's going to be, um, that's going to be um, in his long-term self-interest. Okay, so that's an end that's brought about at a fair price for a maxim that cannot be universalized. Okay, so I just said that that end is good, but not made good by him. How can it possibly be good? If not made good by him, look, didn't I just, didn't I just assume that there's some what natural end that's good? If not made good by that will, any thoughts? The, the answer is no. I didn't just assume that it was. How is that end made good? If not by the shopkeepers, max. All right, so your clue is the shopkeeper is not the only person in this story. The customer, right? The shopkeeper didn't make that end be good by his goodwill. But that same end is made good by somebody else's. Name. 